Imagine, if you will, a vast plain on an alien planet. The blue-gray mineral crust is coated in a softer, looser layer, a fuzzy coating of teal alien lichen and grasses. Strange plants bearing strange fruits stand in the field, creating patchy stands of alien trees. Small creatures fly in the air, their bodies aerodynamically adapted to their windy niche, so similar to earthly birds, and yet somehow different, alien. Larger organisms, strange alien beasts that forage the vegetation or that prey upon the others, roam the landscape. Perhaps it is an alien world that is billions of years old, having evolved across the eons under the warm and watchful eye of its parent star. But in recent eons, the star has begun to redden and expand, like some kind of angry god coming to consume the world. This alien planet gets warmer, and over millions of years, its life tries to adapt to the increasing heat and aridity. And even though the life is successful for some millions of years, the host star keeps growing, larger and larger, hotter, and the habitable zone, which has been slowly moving outwards and expanding along with the star, now slips beyond the orbit of this alien world, and its water begins to boil away. The atmosphere becomes hellish, and life begins to die. The life that can burrow underground to stay cool will do so, be they microbe or macroscopic animal. Those that can swim in the oceans will do so for as long as the oceans still exist. But eventually, the outer shell of the star will engulf the planet, and its life will die. For years, the planet is awash in hellfire, and the atmosphere is drastically reformed, if not destroyed entirely. Eons later, when it's all over, all that remains of the star that once was bright and warm is now a pale white dot, nestled in the inky blackness of the void. The alien world is cold, and its star is dead. And so it goes for eternity. This is the story of stars like our sun, which are not big enough to die in a supernova. Instead, stars like our sun will slowly expand and shed their outer layers in a slow burn kind of process. For stars that are big enough to die in a supernova, they will do so, and presumably any inner planets will be physically destroyed and their mass added to the newborn nebula. Perhaps a planet farther out is able to survive this cosmic detonation and somehow remain in orbit around what remains of the star. In both cases, what remains of the star is a white dwarf, an incredibly dense, rapidly cooling, Earth-sized object. Alright, so why do I bring this up? Why are we talking about this? Well, there was a new study published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, and it looked at these worlds orbiting dead stars to study their transmission spectra to see what they were like, and if it was possible that they would support life. Cornell astronomer Dr. Lisa Kaltenegger was an author of the study, and she said, quote, If we would find signs of life on planets orbiting under the light of long dead stars, the next intriguing question would be whether life survived the star's death or start it all over again, a second genesis, if you will." Unquote. Cornell astronomy graduate student Thea Kozakis was the lead author of the paper. She said, quote, If we observe a transit of that kind of planet, scientists can find out what is in its atmosphere, refer back to this paper, match it to spectral fingerprints, and look for signs of life. Publishing this kind of guide allows observers to know what to look for. Unquote. These signs of life, called biosignatures, can be sussed out with a spectroscopic analysis of the planet's atmosphere, which can be achieved when the planet transits in front of its star, blocking out some of its light from reaching our telescopes. Some of the light that passes by the very edge of the planet will go through the atmosphere, and by studying the wavelengths that are filtered through, we can measure what substances might be in the atmosphere. Finding signs of liquid water or methane would be exciting, but finding signs of molecular oxygen would be spectacular. 
In the study, they did this by taking high-resolution transmission spectra for, quote, planets orbiting white dwarfs as they cool from 6,000 to 4,000 K, for, one, planets receiving equivalent irradiation to modern Earth, and two, planets orbiting at the distance around a cooling white dwarf that allows for the longest continuous time in the habitable zone." Unquote. The scientists also say that this work will help prepare and interpret the findings from observations made by the James Webb Space Telescope and other observatories. Honestly, I'm not holding my breath on this one. Life on planets orbiting dead stars is tricky. If the planet orbited in its star's habitable zone before the star died, they might be too far out now that the star has died and collapsed into a white dwarf, and so the world would be freezing cold. This would prohibit life, I think, especially if all of the liquid water has either boiled away in the initial death of the star, or if whatever's left is now frozen into solid ice. If that's the case, that makes it a lot harder for life to keep going. And uh, one of the scientists mentioned a second genesis. Well, if water is completely frozen the, the planet over, I don't think it's very likely that you're going to see a second genesis. I mean, maybe you would have microscopic life, like bacteria, you know, some kind of microbe, but macroscopic life in such a scenario would almost be certainly out of the question. There's no way that anything analogous to vertebrate animals or trees would survive the star's death process. And even if they somehow did, they wouldn't be able to survive on the now frozen planet, with no liquid water and little to no remaining plant and animal life. However, ever since reading about the deep biome here on Earth, I can't help but think that microbial life is extremely common, even on worlds that are far from their star and freezing cold. As long as the planet generates internal heat, through radioactive decay processes and an active liquid core and whatnot, there, there will be geochemical processes that bring stuff like hydrogen and sulfur close to the surface, and microbial life can adapt to use these chemical energy sources to survive. In fact, life in the deep biome on our theoretical alien planet may not even notice the death of the star. They're kilometers under the surface, and they're really only concerned with the heat of the planet's core and the nutrients in the nearby rock. All the surface life on a planet was destroyed by the star dying, for example, but the life in this deep biome was uh, somehow preserved, I could realistically see that being a pathway to a second genesis of sorts, or a, a pseudo-second genesis. Because, I mean, technically these microbes would be descendant from the first genesis of life, but if everything else was destroyed, if everything else was killed off, and some lineage of these uh, deep biomicrobes somehow came back to the surface and reseeded the surface with life, that would be a pseudo-second genesis, and I think that that is distinctly possible. Although, under the cold sunlight of a distant white dwarf, I don't think it's very viable that any kind of large macroscopic ecology would be set up and maintained. If anything, you might have small, limited colonies of bacteria or microbes or whatever but I don't think the alien ecology would ever come close to what it was before. It's a really interesting question, and I wonder what findings will come from this particular field of inquiry. I'm not going to rule anything out, but I'm honestly not expecting to find much in the way of life on planets orbiting dead stars. Not with telescopes, at least. You know, we'd have to send someone there to take soil samples directly. But even though I'm skeptical, I would love to be surprised. Oh,